So now that you have the foundation, we've talked about some of the elements, uh, we've talked about our molecules, you know by now our four main macromolecules, and we've talked about the cellular structures, you're now familiar with, uh, you're now familiar with the organelles, you're familiar with uh, the enzymes, how enzymes work. What we're going to do is we're going to start to tie that in and go into our first lecture, our cellular physiology. And with that, we're going to look at respiration. And one of, one of the things that I wanted you guys to pull back from, which was one of your first quiz questions, was organic molecule that is the source of energy currency, or uh, is the energy currency, is adenosine triphosphate. And so what we're going to be talking about today is how we're able, how cells are able to, and this is not necessarily just human physiology, this is actually just physiology. You'll see that pretty much any, any living being that needs to generate that form of energy currency, ATP, has to undergo cellular respiration. And cellular respiration is going to involve the breakdown of a metabolic substrate. And that substrate is glucose, which you're going to be seeing in just a little bit. That doesn't mean that glucose is the only energy we burn. We're actually burning quite a bit. Whatever you eat, essentially, is going to be broken down into ATP, whether it's going to be fats, whether it's going to be proteins. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be able to learn, especially in our digestive system, that we're typically protein sparing. We don't try and burn protein as a primary energy source. We typically rely on fats, and we rely on our carbohydrates to get broken down into that single monomer or single monosaccharide called glucose. And so the question of, that's going to be answered today is what happens to that glucose molecule? So let's take a look at our first set of slides. And you'll see we're talking about cellular respiration. And what you see on my screen is not just a bunch of scribbling going on. That actually is the metabolic pathway. So if you were to draw chemically what exactly is happening with that glucose molecule, as well as the other things, our, our fats, as well as our proteins, you can see that it's all completely metabolized. And if you've ever had instructors before ever draw it out, that's not the entire picture. In fact, they're giving you kind of an introduction. And again, I'm giving you an introduction here, but you would have learned this stuff in biology. I've heard of instructors talking about it sitting there drawing this entire thing out. Um, I'm not going to, and I want to give you a preface here, that I'm not going to require you guys to remember uh, the, the chemical background. I'm not going to have you draw things out. I'm not going to have you guys draw where the hydrogen goes in, in glucose or anything like that. That's not physiology. That's not, at least from my opinion, that's not really the heart of what I want you guys to get across. So with that, uh, again, this is mostly review. You guys are assumed to have known this stuff. This is really a refresher, but I feel it's still an important background so that you understand how we generate energy, how do we generate ATP in order to fuel all those organ systems, to have them running. So with that, we're going to look at our topics today, cellular respiration, which we're going to break down into three components. We're going to see glycolysis, we're going to see the citric acid cycle, also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, and then lastly, we'll talk about the electron transport chain. But before we start, we do need to talk about the concept of metabolism. And what exactly is metabolism? You probably have heard the term. But metabolism is really just the whole concept of taking energy. It's the energy transformation in a cell. And we're going to be able to harvest energy from some source, uh, from at least harness a food source from some source of some kind. And we're going to be able to take, and take that molecule, break it down, break apart those bonds, and transform that energy that we're getting from those bonds to couple that with other things. If you're wondering what things am I talking about, refer back to slide or your lecture, lecture number one. And that last slide on there, I talked about all the cellular functions, reproduction, growth, movement, all that stuff is going to be involved. And this is really this sort of bouncing of energy back and forth. But when we look, when we break down metabolism, we can see that things are giving us energy and things are requiring energy. And so what we can divide metabolism down to, we can break it down to catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions. When we look at catabolic, catabolic is the breakdown. We're taking large molecules. If you, whatever you ate today, for instance, if it was, um, let's say you ate potatoes. You took our, our starchy molecules, which is a long polymerized uh, bunch of, polysaccharides put together, a string of glucose molecules, and we're going to break that down into smaller molecules. 
And we're going to take that glucose molecule and we're going to break that down even more. And that's going to end up releasing energy. So catabolic means the breakdown of larger molecules into smaller molecules. The opposite of that is anabolic. Like I've used that term before, anabolic steroids. These are things that are building. So if we break down glucose into smaller molecules, we're going to be able to build larger molecules. And what molecules are we building? Well, we can talk about proteins again, like, like just like we talked about the other day. The other day we talked about how we can produce proteins from amino acids. We start off with our primary sequence, we start to fold it in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then we're shipping those proteins out of the cell. All that requires energy that we're getting from our, our catabolic reactions. So here, anabolic means the synthesis of large energy molecules, large energy storing molecules, whether they'll be used for energy, whether they'll be used for growth, anything to support cellular functions. Now, the other terms you see on here, exergonic and endergonic, again, something that I've, uh, I know we're just revisiting, but this is from the perspective of energy. And exergonic, if you remember, is the exit of energy, the release of energy. Well, anabolic is endergonic, meaning the energy entering. So exer and endergonic. Endergonic, this is energy going into in order to result in the synthesis of molecules. And typically when you look at these reactions, you have exergonic and endergonic reactions. We can now define these in terms of, when we look at reactions, you'll see that we're kind of ping-ponging back and forth between these two. We're going to see the term redox reactions. And let me help you kind of get into that. Before we get into what redox is, we have to uh, uh, understand the terms oxidation and reduction. Whenever we look at energy bouncing back and forth, we're taking a molecule, we're going to be breaking it down, or we're going to be building it back up. It's going to be involving the movement of energy, and that energy comes in the form of electrons. So when we look at a molecule, whether it's going to be gaining an electron or losing an electron, are what's going to be the terms that are used, oxidation and reduction. These are actually the correct terms for them. So oxidation. Oxidation is the loss of electrons, while reduction is the gain of electrons. Now, don't think that oxidation is uh, catabolic or, or any of that. This is just from the perspective of looking at what happens to the electrons themselves. Because the overall message, yes, at the very end is exergonic and endergonic, but during this process, when we look at a reaction, when we're looking at glucose, we're trying to see, are we, are we stripping electrons off of it to, to use that energy to be used on another energy? So while I talk about the gain of electrons, typically when you're stripping an electron off, you, you've got an electron, but you're also going to be freeing, just like Eli said, we're, being, we're freeing a hydrogen ion. So in, in essence, what this actually is, a hydrogen ion, it's a hydrogen with no electron, so it's a proton. So it's an electron and a proton. So typically these things go hand in hand. So the way oxidation and reduction is typically uh, defined is a transfer of electrons. But I also like to just make it a little bit easier for you guys, is to also see the loss or gain of hydrogen ions. Whenever you see electron moves, hydrogen ions will go along with it as well. So the way you can remember a reaction, whether it's oxidation or reduction, is this mnemonic that I, that I just drew out for you, oil rig. Oxidation is the loss of electrons, while reduction is the gain in electrons. And I'll be able to give you an example in our next slide. And redox, redox reactions are a combination. If you look at re, reduction, and ox for oxidation. And an example of that is this central dogma equation right here. What are we doing with our glucose molecule? This is glucose. This, you know, is oxygen. H2O, water. CO2 and an ATP. This right here is the central concept of redox reactions. It's a combination of oxidation and reduction. We'll be able to pick this apart. If you ever look at what's taking place here, 
glucose plus oxygen is going to get broken down, down eventually down the line. We're going to be able to get water and CO2. And then you'll notice one of our products on here. We know these are reactants. These are our products. And one of the products on there is ATP. And we're getting 36 ATP per glucose molecule. So my question for you guys is, is this an endergonic reaction or an exergonic reaction? Exergonic. Exergonic. How do you know it's exergonic? Energy. ATP. Because ATP is one of our products. Thank you. So we're getting a release of energy. And this energy can be used, that ATP can be used to couple with other reactions that are endergonic. Things that require energy. And everything that we're going to be learning as we go through neurophysiology, we're going to get into digestive, urinary, we're going to get into cardiovascular, the heartbeats, we're going to look at vessels expanding and contracting, all of that. Any type of muscle action, whether it's hormonal action, neural action of any kind, is going to require ATP. So this serves the foundation. So with this release of energy, an exergonic reaction, and what we see is the net production of energy from the breakdown of glucose. Just like I said earlier, uh, on the two main points that I talked about. And again, the redox reaction here, you can see my definitions on there. Now, this was the reaction. If you take a look at this reaction, and just kind of for fun, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the exact reverse of this. You take H2O, you take water and carbon dioxide, add a little energy, and you know that energy comes from the sun, and if photosynthesis is the exact reverse, where your plants are producing glucose and producing oxygen as a byproduct. And you see what we're doing is we're doing the exact opposite. And then as a, another fact too, people like to think that uh, plants are always producing energy, but they're only producing energy during the day when the sun is, uh, when the sun is and providing energy. But to support all the cellular functions, such as growth, cells are also doing this. They're doing exactly this. They're taking glucose, the glucose that they were able to store, for instance, starch, like potatoes, storing those glucose molecules as, as a form of carbohydrates, as, as known as starch, to be able to store it when needed. So with this equation, we've known this equation for quite some time, the question is, where do these products come from? And typically when I ask this question of that CO2, where do you think CO2 ends up from? Or where, where does it come from? How do we get CO2 produced? Where do you think that CO2 comes from? By looking at our products over here. We'll get it from the cells, of course. But where, where do, where, if you were to look at glucose or you get it from oxygen? People like to think that it's from oxygen. Glucose. But that's not really true, and you're gonna we're gonna be able to answer that we're gonna be able to answer that question at the very end of today. So that same question that was asked was the same question they probably thought of when they first looked at this equation, and they thought they knew that glucose plus oxygen produces water and CO2. They just you take a plant, you provide it with a uh, anything, you take cells and you provide it with those. It knows it produces energy. So the question is, where do we know what, where does CO2 come from, and where does H2O come from? So when scientists came up with, it, with that, they've said, okay, let's, let's take a look at this. Let's take, a, let's take a, uh, a cell or a plant. Just remember when we talked in our first lecture, we talked about isotopes. They can take a radioactive isotope. And in this case, what they used was they used radiated glucose. So here they used a radioactive isotope of oxygen in glucose. And they know if they give radioactive glucose with, with, with oxygen, where did it end up? Well, they ended up specifically with radioactive CO2. So they know that the oxygen on here came out in the oxygen in CO2. So they know during this whole transformation of turning glucose plus oxygen down that line, cellular respiration, the products that oxygen came out tagged in the CO2. So they know this somewhere down the line becomes CO2. And then they did the exact opposite. To prove their point, they took radioactive oxygen, run it through that whole experiment again, find out where that ended up, 
and they found out they had radioactive water at the very end. And that's simple. You can just give somebody radioactive oxygen, and what they'll end up doing is either sweating it out, or they'll end up urinating out water. Okay. So when we look at these uh, reactions taking place, now that we're able to break it down, we can take a look at what we mentioned earlier, our redox reaction. I'm looking at our, our examples right here. Here we can see the example of oxygen. And oxygen is gaining hydrogen ions. If we look at O2, eventually it's gaining hydrogen ions and also gaining electrons. So my question to you, is this reduction or is this oxidation? Reduction. It's reduction. And hence this is a redox reaction. We know that this, when we look at glucose, is losing hydrogen ions. So therefore it must be oxidation. oxidation. Hence why this is a redox reaction. So that they know. They, they, uh, they know where the uh, CO2 comes from. It comes specifically from glucose. And they knew that water comes in from oxygen. And what we're going to be able to do and by the end of today is be able to pinpoint where that takes place. So we know that oxygen creates water. And again, we'll point out where that takes place. So we're going to take a step back and go back to what we talked about in our biochemistry lecture, is to look at these reactions taking place. And view that from the perspective of, and you don't need to know the term Gibbs free energy, but this is the energy that you can measure from our reactants to our products. And this helps pinpoint uh, the difference between exergonic reactions and energonic reactions. Last week we saw this uh, graph to our left. We see uh, energy and we see time. And if we were to measure the energy in the reactants and measure the, uh, the energy in the products, what we can do is we can measure the difference of energy in our products minus our reactants. And we know that the change in free energy, which is delta G, okay, and again, I won't ask you guys exactly what delta G is, but you should understand the concept that we're ending up with less energy than with what we started. And that must mean that delta G, which is the change is, uh, is a negative change, hence why delta G is less than zero, that means energy is being released by exergonic reactions, which is exactly what the definition that I just gave you guys. And we know that the very bit right here is activation energy. It's energy that's required to get this thing started. So as we talked about, we knew in exergonic reactions that things can just happen. Eventually, maybe the reactants would eventually pick up enough energy that it would get over that little hurdle, which we know is activation energy, which you know from the quiz, and then the reaction would take for, uh, place further. And in cellular respiration, we'll be able to see that. But in order to speed that reaction up, what do we employ? If you remember from last week's lecture, what do we do? What do we introduce into the system to speed this reaction up without changing the change, uh, without changing the free energy? We introduce something that would speed the reaction. It's like, it's something that catalyzes the reaction. Enzymes. Catalysts. Enzymes. Catalyst, yeah. But enzymes are the reactions that is, is, is what, we're, what I'm looking for specifically. Enzymes are introduced to speed this reaction up. And we're going to be seeing that in cellular respiration. We're going to be seeing a lot of enzymes that are involved to speed this reaction up. Okay, so we know energy is released. And if we look at endergonic reactions, endergonic reactions, if you were to measure the energy from reactants to products, you'll see that we're gaining free energy. Hence why delta G is greater than zero. It's positive. It requires energy. And again, same thing, you'll see energy is being introduced, and then we see we need a certain amount of activation energy to get to that hump to finally get our product. And where does that energy come from? It comes from our exergonic reactions. So exergonic reactions, again, are supplying the energy for endergonic reactions. So we break things down in order to build things back up. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our exergonic are our catabolic and these are our anabolic reactions. Again, both of these comprising all of metabolism. So we couple these in order for cellular functions to take place. 
So now let's take that back to what we learned earlier in this reaction. Let's start to tie that stuff in. And keep in mind that since we're breaking, since cellular respiration is an exergonic reaction, I want you guys to be familiar with this graph right here. We're going to be able to look at that in just a little bit. But before we get into it, I want to go into the key players. Who is going to be involved in cellular respiration? We know glucose is going to be involved. That's a big giveaway. Uh, and then we need electron acceptors. If we're stripping electrons off something, electrons have a good amount of energy to them. And what we need to do with those electrons is we need some middleman to come in and carry that electron over down to its final place. So keep that in mind. I know I'm kind of giving some vagueness right now, but that final destination, we need some carriers. And we have two carriers that are, are involved in this process. Nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide. And I would never ask you guys to remember the names of those. We know they're called NAD. And the other one is called flavin adenine dinucleotide, also known as FAD. And both of these are actually derived from vitamins. When you, when you learn about why vitamins are necessary, vitamins, derivative of, uh, of B vitamin. It's niacin, also known as vitamin B3. And the other one is a uh, derivative of a, uh, of a B2 vitamin, also known as riboflavin, so B2. So these, if you were to take a look, are electron acceptors, meaning that they're going to be gaining electrons. And then also, they're also gaining the hydrogen ions that come with it. So you can see that we have NAD, uh, NAD+, it's going to be gaining a proton and gaining an electron. And therefore, you're going to be able to see that NAD is going to be if it's gaining an electron, is it being oxidized or reduced? Reduced. reduced. So we're going to see the reduction. Both of these are going to be re reduced. Reduced to NADH and FADH2. So keep that in mind. These are going to be the key players are middlemen. They're going to be carrying it over to their final destination. And then, lastly, adenosine triphosphate. This you guys already know because this was a quiz question. Adenosine triphosphate. And let's take a look at what adenosine triphosphate looks like. So top left, here you can see the structure of it. Remember, this was one, one of our uh, nucleic acids that was specialized. We had adenine, which is our, our nucleotide. Ribose, which is our sugar, we had a pentose sugar attached to phosphate groups. And we have three phosphate groups. One, two, three. Hence the term adenosine triphosphate. And like I mentioned, there's the bonds between each of these. And there's a lot of energy stored within the phosphate ions, or within the phosphate groups of that ATP molecule. And typically what happens with ATP is when you see ATP, we have our three phosphate, two, three, what we typically do to release energy from ATP is to break off that third phosphate ion or that phosphate group. And with that break, with that break, what we end up seeing is we see energy being released. We break down uh, uh, ATP into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So that, that break off of that last phosphate ion is going to be used, the energy that's released is going to be used for endergonic reactions. This is an exergonic reaction. All this right here to the right is exergonic. Now the question is, what happens to that phosphate ion? Well, we're going to be able to see what happens with that phosphate ion. Typically what's going to happen is it's going to be passed along to the next molecule. And, and in that process, uh, we'll talk about is on the next slide, it's called phosphorylation. Now, on the other hand, when we get ADP, how do we turn ADP back to ATP? And that's what's going to happen at the end of today's lecture. We're going to turn ADP back to ATP. After ATP is being used, it's going to be uh, used, and it's going to be turned back to ATP. And that's where we're undergoing cellular respiration. We're harnessing the energy from glucose, combine that with a phosphate ion to turn that back into ATP so it can support cellular functions. And what cellular functions are they? Well, you can see nine that I have on there for you, of which the ones that are relevant physiologically 
bonds, E. Cytoplasmic transport, oh, right there in the middle. Active transport, active transport, our sodium potassium pump, if you remember that from the other day, we talked about the sodium potassium pump. We're pumping ions against its gradient, and that requires energy, and that energy comes in the form of ATP again. Uh, importing metabolites, anytime we're ever moving things in and out, some things require energy, not all. Biosynthesis, of course, anytime any sort of cat, uh, anabolic reactions come to play, anytime we're building something is going to require ATP. Muscle contraction. Again, we don't really go over our musculoskeletal system, but anytime we get uh, and, and a muscle contraction to take place, it's going to use, utilize ATP to drive this myosin ahead and move that along. And then chemical activation. In order to activate something, activate an enzyme, activate a molecule, we're going to phosphorylate it, meaning we're going to not only harvest the energy from ATP, uh, we're going to also attach that phosphate ion onto it. And that's how we're going to be able to tag that. You're going to see that numerous times today. So as we go through that process, when we're generating ATP, remember that we're tapping into ADP sources. ATP that's already been expended into ADP, we're going to combine that with the phosphate ion to replenish itself. So we constantly have this source going back and forth. So the phosphorylation of glucose, all I wanted to do on here was to show you what's happening. In, in, with ATP, we're, taking, we're breaking apart that third phosphate uh, group harnessing that energy, and we're removing that hydrogen ion. So we're going to strip that hydrogen ion off that hydroxyl group, off glucose. So here what we're doing is we're, we're removing an electron and removing a hydrogen ion. So if it's losing, this is the oxidation of glucose. We're stripping that hydrogen ion, and that phosphate ion that comes in from ATP is going to get placed onto where that hydrogen ion originally came from. So this is what we call glucose 6-phosphate. We've essentially taken a phosphate ion, we've tagged that glucose molecule, and that is going to be our first step in cellular respiration, which you'll be able to see in the next couple slides. So that is an example of phosphorylation. And what's required of this is a specific enzyme. Our enzyme on there is hexokinase, also known as glucokinase. That's the name of the enzyme that strips that hydrogen ion and attaches and metabolizes ATP and attaches that phosphate ion on there. And I'll talk about the relevance in that in just a little bit. So all of cellular respiration, when you saw that equation earlier, it's not like we take a glucose molecule and undergo one reaction and end up with our byproducts or our, our products. We have to go through several steps in place. And those steps that are involved take place in different areas of the cell. The first portion we're going to be able to see, if you look at cellular respiration, we're going to see is anaerobic, anaerobic. So the first easiest way to define what aerobic means, aerobic means oxygen dependent. It requires oxygen in order for that process to take place. The other portion is called anaerobic, meaning it's oxygen independent meaning that we can take our metabolic substrate, glucose, and we can burn that. We, and what I mean burn, I use the term loosely. We can have that undergo glycolysis, which is, if you look at the term, lysing is to break apart. Glyco refers to glucose. So we're burning or we're breaking apart glucose. And where does that take place? It takes place in the cytoplasm. So if I were to draw out a cell, this is our, uh, our cell membrane, and then we have uh, glycolysis taking place. You don't necessarily have to draw that because I got that for you on the next slide over under the roadmap. Here you can see glycolysis taking place in the, in the, in the cytoplasm, and then in the presence of oxygen, we'll be able to undergo the next step. The term that I'd like you guys to be familiar with is glycolysis is that it is called substrate phosphorylation. Again, I will define what that term means in just a little bit. Aerobic, we're going to take that byproduct that comes in from glycolysis, which you'll be able to see in a little bit, is called is pyruvic acid. 
And we're going to shuttle that into the mitochondria. This is a reaction called the transition reaction. We're going to take the byproduct from transition reaction, and which we'll know as acetyl-CoA, and it's going to undergo a cycle inside the matrix of the mitochondria. So we've shuttled pyruvic acid. We're going to shuttle that into the mitochondria. It's going to undergo the Krebs cycle. And then the last portion is called the electron transport chain, where we have enzymes littered all along the cristae of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So these, if you remember in our, uh, on our lecture the other day, you saw a bunch of enzymes, a bunch of studded inner mitochondrial membrane, and that's where our enzymes are going to reside. And that's going to complete that last bit of cellular respiration for us. So like I said, you can see all this taking place in this general roadmap. And what we're first doing is we're taking glucose, we're shuttling that into the cell. If you remember, when we, lost, we saw uh, the other day, we knew that glucose, the concentration of glucose, is high on the outside. So we're shuttling glucose into the cell. And what we're utilizing here is, is this a carrier or a channel that we're going to be using to get glucose into the cell? Carrier. A carrier. And that carrier, in this case, is GLUT4. Its one task is to take glucose and move it down its diffusion gradient. Glucose is too big to cross through the cell membrane itself, so it's going to carry glucose from the extracellular side and shuttle it into the intracellular side. So we get glucose into the cell, and now that we get glucose into the cell, it's, under, it's going to undergo glycolysis. And in glycolysis, we're going to be able to get ATP from. We're not getting all 36 ATP, we're just going to be getting just a little bit of ATP. So this is the first step in that process. And uh, we'll be able to explain this a little bit where you're going to see the reduction of NAD. And then our end product of glycolysis is pyruvate. And, and don't worry about that. If you're writing down what the end products are, it's cool. We're getting, we're getting to that point. Um, and then pyruvate, whether it's going to be present in oxygen or without oxygen, can go of two ways. There's a fermentation process. Actually, the term isn't really fermentation. And, and, and uh, I will get into that in just a bit. Uh, the other process is the aerobic metabolism. So oxygen present. So it is oxygen dependent. We're going to take pyruvate, shuttle it in. It's going to go through the Krebs cycle, also known as the TCA cycle, the tri tricarboxylic acid cycle. And we're going to release some ATP from there. And then we're going to use our key players, NADH and FADH2, that will, get, that will contribute to the electron transport chain that happens along the inner membrane. And then that's where we're going to be able to get our bulk of ATP. So now that you get sort of the big picture, what we're going to do in, uh, next is to zoom in to glycolysis. So let's take a look at our next slide in glycolysis. And this, road, this is another roadmap here, but uh, you see what, what's taking place in the mitochondria. I grade this out for a reason so that we can specifically focus what's happening in the cytoplasm. And what you'll notice here is glucose is our reactant. Our product is pyruvate down the line. But there's numerous enzymes that are involved in every one of these steps. These are all byproducts. These are all midway points. And each midway point requires an enzyme. And I'm not going to require you guys to memorize those enzymes in between. But these are all the byproducts. These are all the steps that are involved to turn glucose back down to pyruvate. It has to go through each one of these steps. In fact, there's even more steps than these. This is actually just a simplified version. So what we know is the first bit. Glucose is going to get tagged with a phosphate ion by burning one of those ATP molecules. And we're going to turn that into glucose 6-phosphate, just like we saw on this slide over. So glucokinase is that first enzyme involved. Then the next step is going to be called fructose 6-phosphate. And then in the next step, we're going to, again, use another ATP molecule and turn that into uh, two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Again, you don't need to know the names of these. But we've split that, that byproduct into two different parts. So if you take a look at that, what we're seeing is that we're using ATP. We're using specifically two ATP. Now the question that I'd like you guys to think about is why are we using two ATP if we're trying to harness more ATP? So think about that. 
when we get into the next stage, once we split that uh, fructose 6-phosphate into two glyceraldehydes, we're going to be able to see that NAD is getting reduced into NADH. We're stripping electrons off. And we're going to have our carriers that are going to pick up those electrons. Now, the next thing you're going to see, we're going to have uh, one 3 biphosphoglycerate. Again, you don't need to know the names. But when we, we go undergo the next step, you'll see that we're going to be able to phosphorylate our ADP, meaning we're turning ADP into 2 ATP. And then that last step, here we get phosphoenol pyruvate, and we're taking 2 ADP and turning that to 2 ATP. We're harnessing the energy as we transform that glucose molecule and turning that into 2 net ATP. So here we used 2 ATP, here we get 4 ATP. Our net gain from burning that one glucose molecule is 2 net <coughs> ATP. At any point on here, did you see oxygen being used? Take a look through. Do you see oxygen at any point in here? No. No, we don't. Hence why it is oxygen independent. It's anaerobic. Glycolysis is anaerobic. We're using energy. This was an energy investment stage, and this was the energy harvesting stage. So let's pair that up with that free energy. Again, that graph that we talked about. And here you can see glucose. We use two ATPs to turn it into uh, to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So that product is right there at the very top, glyceraldehyde diphosphates. And here you can see that by breaking apart those two ATPs, we're getting a gain in energy. So now I'm going to ask you guys to answer that question. That 2 ATP that we used, what would be the term for that? That ATP that's being used in order to end up with our product. If this is our reactant, this is our product, we're investing 2 ATP. It's just a little bit of energy that we need to invest in order for the reaction to take place. What was that term called? Activation energy? Oh. Those are quick questions, right? Yeah, they already answered that. So we're investing a little bit of energy in order for the reaction to take place. So that investment is the activation energy. Now, if you measure the measure, uh, if you measure the amount of energy in glucose and pyruvic acid, that doesn't change. But we need to get this started. This was that example that I used earlier. In order for a reaction to take place, you need to invest a little energy. In order for to get that roller coaster to go, you need to give it a little push, and that's exactly what we're doing here, starting that reaction. And of course. We have numerous enzymes that come in and take place. If you were to get glucose to turn into pyruvic acid on its own, you've probably got to throw a lot of energy into it, and eventually it could turn into pyruvic acid. But we have actually three and even more enzymes that are involved that eventually will turn it into a pyruvic acid with less energy. So numerous enzymes are involved to make this as efficient as possible, to use the less amount of energy. If you can invest a little bit of energy and get this whole reaction to take place, great. That's exactly what we're doing. And that's what we, what we use to invest. That's our payback. Because afterwards, we're going to be able to harvest it in these two points. As we turn these later on, you're going to be able to say that we get two ATP at this step and another two ATP at this step. And if you can see where that takes place, that takes place at these points by phosphoglycerate to phosphoglycerate, and phosphoenopyruvate to pyruvate. So that's what we've talked about. And then, uh, another thing to note on here, the, the change in energy. We get a change in energy where our, our final products, pyruvic acid, has less energy than what we end up with glucose. So here we would note that the change in free energy is going to be negative. It's less than zero. So think of this about this conceptually. If I have less energy in pyruvic acid, where did that energy go? I lost a good amount of energy. That's delta G. Where did that energy go? I'll give you a clue. What you learned last week, you learned that that came off as heat. Kinetic energy. That kinetic energy is off to do something else. We're not getting off heat, necessarily, per se, in this, in this process. 
where did that energy go? Go to the next step. Yeah. And still potential energy. What did we end up with? What was our uh, what, were, what was our product? Perfect. What was our net gain in energy? Two. Two ATP. So, in order for that ADP to get turned back into ATP, it's high energy state, we're turning glucose, putting two ATP into this process to then release the energy from those byproducts to turn ADP back to ATP. And that ATP can go back and support all of these processes. And once they get used, when we build that protein, we're going to end up with a bunch of ATP that's now back to ADP. We need to turn that AT, ADP back to ATP. And in the presence of, without oxygen, we take that glucose molecule, do exactly that, and we end up with two net ATP. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's where that energy went, is the production of the phosphorylation of AT, ADP back to ATP so that it can do work. So this process right here, glucose to pyruvic acid, is that an endergonic or exergonic reaction? Exergonic. How do we define ender and exergonic? The direction of energy, right? Yeah. And this is energy exiting the system. Exergonic. Okay. Now ADP to ATP, is that exergonic or endergonic? Endergonic. It's endergonic. Yeah. It requires energy to turn ADP back to ATP. So this is another example of where we used an exergonic reaction, coupled that with an endergonic reaction to take place so that we have our source, our energy currency right here, ATP. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. So now, out of the 36 ATP that we learned from the very beginning, this is where we get two ATP first. So it requires a little bit of energy at first in order to end up with that. Now let's just look at what's happening to the hydrogen ions and the electrons themselves. And the breakdown of what, start, what we started off with, with glucose. Glucose is C6H12O6. There's six carbons. And eventually, when we look at pyruvate, it gets broken down into two pyruvate molecules where we get uh, a pyruvate molecule with C3H4O3, and it's three carbons. So we have, we have two acids that we end up with, uh, each with three carbons. So if we look at the carbons, then eventually we have to look at the hydrogens, and we have to look at the oxygens. And this, if you remember from chemistry, is what we call stoichiometry. All we're doing is making sure, do we end up with the same carbons at the other, at the other end? 1C6 for glucose, and we end up C3 plus C3. So we have six carbons on both ends, so our, our carbons are good, right? What about the hydrogen molecules? No. What about the oxygen molecules? Yes. yes. So they all balance out. So we're losing four hydrogens in this process. So the question is, where do those four hydrogens go? And then, consequently, what happened to those electrons that follow those hydrogen ions? That's the question. And it is. And that's where our middleman comes in, because we can't just have electrons just floating around. They've got to be carried by somebody. And that's where we first see our NAD. Our NAD come in, okay, so each, uh, each NAD that comes in gets picked up by, I'm sorry, each electron that comes in, we get a pair of hydrogen ions and a pair of electrons. And that gets picked up by each NAD molecule. So each NAD carries two electrons, and two hydrogens. So we get, with this process, when we go from NAD plus, plus, an H, uh, 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 plus two electrons, we end up with NADH plus H plus. And that's okay, because the main idea of what we're getting across is that we get, uh, in this process, we're reducing NAD to become NADH. It's our carrier. We'll talk about where that NADH goes. Okay, well, let's continue. We've already talked about our glucose transporter, as we mentioned in this previous slide, our glute tra uh, transporter. 
what we're doing with that, the, that, that transporter, once that glucose is transported in, what we're doing is we're going to be activating that glucose. Take a look at that first step on here. Glucose to glucose 6 phosphate. This is where glucokinase or hexokinase, as I mentioned in this previous slide, hexokinase is coming in to phosphorylate glucose. Now the question is, why do we need to do that? So we're activating it, and in the process we're activating it uh, with a phosphate ion that comes in from ATP. And through that phosphorylation, what we're doing is we're trapping that glucose into the cell. Remember what I said about that phosphate and oxygen. They have a tendency to become very electron hungry. And if, it, if it's electron hungry, if you take a look at it, this is going to make it more polar. And therefore, if it's more polar, not only do you have a large molecule, but now it's even more polar. So it traps it into the cell. So that phosphorylation of glucose starts the process of glycolysis. So now that it's not able to leave the cell, I do want to throw in this next slide on here. This is just going to kind of help clarify things. Because when we talk about pyru pyruvic acid and pyruvate, you'll probably hear pyruvate, you'll probably hear pyruvic acid. The book uses one, you read other sources and they say the other. And you're probably thinking, what's the difference between the two? Well, one, pyruvate is just, uh, all it is is the ion. You've, you've taken the pyruvic acid. You see one, two, three, three carbons. Here's our carboxylic acid right here. This was our functional group. And all we're doing when this is called pyruvic acid because it has an acid, what we're doing is taking off that excess hydrogen and we're calling it pyruvate. So that's the name of the ion. So this anion is called pyruvate. Remember, anion is negative, cation is positive. So it's just adding, uh, what was it, the hydrogen? Yeah, so if it was an acid, it would have that carboxylic uh, hydrogen on there. This is called pyruvate just because we stripped it all off. That's the only difference between the two. But basically, they're the same thing. One is ionized, this one's electrically neutral. But pyruvate and pyruvic acid are the same. This right here just basically does the same thing that we've already looked at, except again, from a different perspective. We're taking glucose and we're splitting it into two pyruvic acids. Again, all the different intermediates or byproducts in between. We're using 2-ATP to turn it into fructose 1,6-biphosphate, and then we take each of these, turn them back into their intermediates, eventually back to pyruvic acid. So here you can see at each step where ATP is being harvested, and where ATP is being invested. So this represents the activation energy. These two points right here represent the uh, electron, I'm sorry, the energy harvesting stage. And these two are our progress. So I've used that term earlier. If you go back to your earlier slides, I called glycolysis, in, that per, in the process of glycolysis, it's called substrate phosphorylation. And in the book and in many other sources, they have you Explain the difference between substrate phosphorylation versus oxidative phosphorylation. Because we're taking ATP, we're stripping off, we're harvesting the energy from ATP back to ADP. We're taking that phosphate ion and we're stripping that back and putting it back to ATP. And let's take a look at how that works. Let's take one of our substrates. And here I'm taking a look at phosphoenolpyruvate. If I take phosphoenol pyruvate, you'll see that I'm going to turn that into pyruvate. This is our reactant. This is our product. We're going to have an enzyme. And that enzyme on here is called pyruvate kinase. We're going to be able to strip, we're able to take phosphoenol pyruvate and turn that to pyruvate and then also harness that energy from that process to turn 2 ADP to 2 ATP. So let's take a look at what that looks like from a molecular level. Here's our enzyme. This right here is a site that is active. And what would we call that site? Active site. Right? So this is the active site. It's an active site because it has our substrate, and our substrate in this case is phosphoenolpyruvate. You take that substrate, and here you can see the design of it. You can see you can see the 
the makeup of it, one, two, three carbons, these are three carbon uh, substrate, you see a phosphate ion that's attached to it. So in this active site, we bind PEP. The other substrate that's required, so if this is reactant number one, we need reactant number two. This should start to look familiar, so that if you remember, we did A plus B turns to C. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. And in that process, what we're doing is we're also releasing energy. So reactant number one, reactant number two. And what's happening in this process, this enzyme has one job, and that is to, when these two reactants bind, is to strip that phosphate ion and catalyze the reaction to bring that over to adenosine diphosphate. So that there's that phosphate ion, it gets transferred over back to ADP, ADP turns to ATP, and we end up with our final products, pyruvate and ATP. So what we're doing is we're metabolizing that substrate, hence the substrate, PEP. You can even get this with the same thing if you were to look at fructose 6-phosphate. There's an enzyme that will, I'm sorry, uh, uh, bi biphosphoglycerate. You can take 1,3-biphosphoglycerate, and that's going to undergo, this is the substrate, it's going to undergo a process where another enzyme, very similar to this one, catalyzes the reaction of taking that phosphate ion, pulling it off of this, and throwing it back to adenosine diphosphate. And again, where does that energy come from? Not that energy comes from that energy transfer that goes back from, okay, going back from, from this step to this step, this step to this step, that energy right here that's lost is coupled to drive this enzyme. So that enzyme right there, that phosphorylation of ADP turning to ATP requires energy. So the breakdown from PEP down to pyruvate fuels that. So now that we know the active site, we know that this is the active site. And you knew from last week's lecture that if I start, start supplying more PEP and more ADP, this is going to drive this reaction forward this way. So one of the things that, uh, that we could modulate this enzyme to work a little bit faster Instead of working on the active site, we were talking about modulating it from the active site. Let's talk about working on another site that's not the active site. You guys remember the name of the site that's not the active site. There's a name on a site of an enzyme that's not the active site. Allosteric site. Allosteric activator and an allosteric inhibitor. So an allosteric activator is something that would activate this enzyme by binding to the allosteric site. Well, naturally, if you want to turn on this enzyme, wouldn't it make sense that you would have one of these byproducts? One of these byproducts early on. Imagine this, if all of a sudden you get, uh, let's say you get uh, fructose biphosphate. Where is it? Fructose, uh, you actually don't see it on here. But one of the metabolites on here is fructose biphosphate. If that comes in and turns on this enzyme that's required over here, wouldn't it make sense? If I'm producing a bunch of one of these intermediates, hey, wrap up those other enzymes down the line because I'm going to get them to work harder. So that one of these metabolites comes in, turns this enzyme on, and now this enzyme can work. You're starting to activate more of these enzymes so they can work later on the line. Now, think about what's going to inactivate this enzyme. Turn this enzyme and make it work slower. Well. One of our products in this is ATP. ATP can come in and phosphorylate this enzyme to turn it off. And that should make sense, because if I'm starting to get a bunch of ATP, I don't really need glycolysis anymore. I've got enough ATP to do what I need. You're not just trying to produce a bunch of ATP and just say, hey, produce a bunch and store it. You only use what you need. So here's that concept, that if I need more ATP, I'm going to make it. And if I have enough ATP, I'm going to turn it off. That sounds like some sort of feedback mechanism, doesn't it? Yeah. Which one is that? 
Is that positive or negative? It's negative feedback. So ATP comes in and turns off this enzyme so that it can't make more ATP. You're going to see a lot of that in physiology, especially when you get into your careers later on. You're going to learn that these come back to turn it back off. This is all an example of negative feedback. And not one that I require you guys, that was sort of a bonus. I'm not going to require you guys, I'm never going to say that on the test, what's going to be the allosteric inhibitor of, of um, pyruvic kinase. That's cool. That's way too much information. You get on later on, medical school, sure, yeah, you're going to have to know that. And then also, what you would also learn, especially in, in uh, even in uh, pharmacology, you'll learn that these enzymes that are involved, something's got to turn off that enzyme to stop that production of something. If you make too much of something, which is typically what uh, a disease, or you don't make enough of something. A disease is exactly like that. So maybe we just got to turn that enzyme off a little bit. We'll cover that when we get into our cardiovascular lecture. There, there might be something that's happening, so what we need to do is turn something off. We need to turn an enzyme off. Therefore, we'll work on that allosteric site. That's exactly how these drugs work. If you learn this stuff, you really learn how drugs work, and you learn on a, on, on a, on a molecular standpoint how that works, you can make some big money. But that's exactly what pharmaceutical industries need. They, they understand how the molecules come in to turn an enzyme off and what's that going to do to the other systems? Is it going to affect anything else? Are they going to produce the unwanted side effects? Exactly. Okay, so I'm, I'm digressing. I don't want to get too, too into it, but at least help you stimulate some things. So that's substrate phosphorylation. Now, what we end up with at the end of glycolysis is pyruvate. And the question is, what do we do with that pyruvate or pyruvic acid? We want to convert that over into our next product called acetyl-CoA. So we've taken pyruvic acid, and you can see that in the reaction next, on the next slide over. We take our pyruvate, and we want to shuttle that into the mitochondrial matrix. We need to get that into the matrix. We started off, that pyruvate was produced in the cytoplasm. It's going to get shuttled into the mitochondria. And in that process, we need to convert it into acetyl-CoA so that it can make it into its next step called the uh, Krebs cycle. So here you can see this process. We're going to take pyruvic acid, or pyruvate, and then it gets shuttled into, here's our uh, outside of the mitochondria, here's the inside of the mitochondria. And this is going to land itself, taking a look at that pyruvate, you're going to see that that pyruvate, we're going to strip off this carboxylic group, and if you look at it, C and then two oxygens. Conveniently, that's going to become CO2. Right? So there's our first product of CO2. Figure that. Didn't that come up from a sugar? You guys thought it was from the oxygen. No. We get our first CO2. Come on. We strip that, 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 that carboxylic group. We're going to reduce NAD into NADH. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to get uh, and coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is going to come in. That's coming in from the mitochondria. That will come in and become acetyl-CoA. So these two carbons that we saw from pyruvate, we've stripped off that, that carboxylic group, which becomes CO2. We're going to attach acetyl-CoA. I'm sorry, attach coenzyme A to become acetyl-CoA. Of course, the question becomes, what happens to that CO2? How do we get rid of that CO2? Well, that CO2 gets shuttled out of the mitochondria into the cytoplasm. That cytoplasm makes its way back out. We're going to shuttle that back out of the cell. That cell is going to get made into the outer extracellular fluid, of which part of the extracellular fluid is the capillaries. That's coming around delivering fresh fluid to the cell. So that CO2 gets diffused out into the circulatory system. And where does that make its way to? To the lungs. So now that we have acetyl-CoA, we're going to take acetyl-CoA and it's going to merge with oxaloacetic acid to form citric acid. That portion right there, you can see on our next slide. So here's acetyl-CoA. This is what came in from, from the transition cycle, acetyl-CoA. This cycle spins around. This entire citric acid cycle spins around, and one of the final products it's called oxaloacetate, or oxaloacetic acid. That comes in to bind to acetyl-CoA, along with the water molecule, to form its byproduct, citrate. So keep in mind that this cycle constantly spins around. 
It goes over and over again. As long as you're shuttling in acetyl-CoA, it's going to continue. So when you get oxaloacetic acid to bind to acetyl-CoA, you're going to see it's actually going to pull off that coenzyme A. So that question of where that coenzyme A came from, came from back here. This is just an intermediate. It's, a, it's, it's one that just comes right back in to feed it right back. It forms its intermediate called citrate. So here you can see one, two, right? You see one, two, two carbons. So that becomes a four carbon called citrate. And we call this the tricarboxylic acid cycle or Krebs cycle. The tricarboxylic acid cycle because we have three, carbo three carboxyl groups. One, two, three. And that's what we start off with. And each of these steps, and again, you're going to see a bunch of intermediates. The question is, do you need to remember them? No, it's okay. You don't need to know them. But the ones that you're going to see that, that you could remember, if you remember from, from biology, the mnemonic that I remember using is g pax -mo. And I remember this because it was, it was a stupid mnemonic. But you know what? I can remember it. Glucose, pyruvic acid, acetyl-CoA, citric acid, alpha-ketoglutaric, succinic, malic, and oxaloacetate. And I still remember to this day because of that mnemonic. And each of these are the intermediates of the citric acid cycle. And you, again, you don't need to know each of the steps. You don't need to know the molecular structures. But what you can see from here is citrate turns into isocitrate. And you'll see that this mnemonic doesn't cover all the intermediates in before that. And actually, there's a lot more intermediates than that. This is, again, like a high school biology class that I took. If you look at one of these, the, any of these carboxylic groups, you'll see that we strip them off. And that stripped off carboxylic group turns into CO2. So right here, you can see this is our first CO2 that's pulled out. Where do we see the next CO2 pulled off? What we're doing with this right here, these two Cs, we're pulling off another carboxylic group and turning that into the next succinyl CoA. So we have two CO2s that we've pulled off per turn of the cycle. Here's succinic. Uh, fumarate, malate, oxaloacetate. And then once that last metabolite comes in, it binds to another acetyl-CoA and repeats the cycle again. Another acetyl-CoA gets shuttled in, it's going to turn again. So as long as, like I said earlier, as long as you're feeding acetyl-CoA into the system, you're keeping the system turning over and over and over again. And in this process, per turn, what we're doing is we're just counting each of are byproducts. CO2, we definitely want to look at ATP, and we also want to look at NADH, and we also want to look at FADH2. CO2 and ATP should be pretty obvious. These were our two electron, acceptor, uh, electron acceptors that, turned, that were reduced into NADH and FADH2. So let's just look at per turn of the cycle. Let's count each of these. How many CO2s do we have? Take a look through. Two. Just two CO2s, right? Uh, do you see ATP anywhere on here? Yes. Yeah, right, right at the bottom. So here what you're looking at is, it's actually GTP, guanine triphosphate. It's okay, it's just, it's, it's another form of ATP. Don't want to get into too much detail. But what we're doing is we're generating one uh, ATP. Uh, NADH, where do you see NADH on there? One, two, three, cool. And then how many FADH2 are you seeing on here? Just one. That's per turn of the citric acid cycle. So my question to you is how many turns are there per glucose molecule? Two. So two. How'd you guys know that? Well, hopefully not because you just said it right there. I realized that after I asked that question. But, yeah, well, that glucose molecule is broken down into two pyruvates. Let me go back to an earlier slide. That glucose gets broken down into two pyruvate acids. And even going back to this earlier slide, that glucose molecule gets broken down into two pyruvic acids. So that pyruvic acid gets converted to acetyl-CoA. That means per glucose molecule, it's going to spin through twice. So let's go back to that earlier thing that we pointed out, where we summed it all up. And we're now going through two turns of this. Two times two times two. And that means we get 
four CO2, two ATP, six NADH, and two FADH2. Don't worry about writing that real quickly because you know what, I summed it up for you on the next slide. So now summing this all up, we've now looked at glycolysis. We looked at the transition reaction, we looked at the Krebs cycle. We know that glycolysis ended up with two net ATP and two NADH. Transition reaction, we saw two NADH and two CO2. Again, per pyruvic acid to acetyl-CoA. And then Krebs cycle, we saw two, six, two, and then four CO2, just as we were able to sum that all up over here. So if we're going to go in, how much, how, what's our net ATP right now? Four. Two plus two. Four. Four ATP. We get four ATP in this process up to this point. But I thought we were making 36 ATP. We've only made four so far. So the question is, what happened to that? Where, where are those th other 32 ATP coming from? That's where we have the next step. The next step being the electron transport chain. So our final destination for the electron transport chain for our, uh, our products at the very end, we were able to see on here the conversion of those, of those carbons from that acetyl-CoA getting transformed back and forth. And it's going to continue on the cycle over and over and over again. So the fate of that glucose molecule is done. It's not being used for anything else. We've stripped off, we've stripped off the uh, carboxylic groups off each of these intermediates, and we've pulled off that CO2. If you were to sum this all up, sum up all those carbons. We know glucose start off with six carbons. We get two carbons from two CO2 produced in the transition cycle. We get four carbons in the four CO2s that are produced in the Krebs cycle. Those carbons are done. What we end up with, with a bunch of, is NADH and FADH2. We've ended up with a bunch of electrons that are carried by NADH. Not, a, not just the electrons, also the hydrogen ions. So this is where they come into play, is the electron transport chain. Fancy that. I was just talking about a bunch of electrons. Now we're going to transport it. And so now we're looking at the cristae, the inner, fossil, uh, the inner membrane of the, mitochondrial mem uh, the mitochondria. So the inner membrane is littered with a bunch of enzymes. And if you were to take a look at it and actually dissect it and look at it, you can see it's just studded with a bunch of enzymes. Those enzymes, those mitochondrial enzymes, represent five major complexes, NADH hydrogenase, or actually dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase, NADH dehydrogenase, succinate dehydrogenase, which is also known as CoQ10. If you've seen CoQ10, you've probably seen at health stores, you would have seen something called coenzyme Q, CoQ10. I know that I've seen it, I've seen it at Costco, they're trying to sell, sell you on buying this stuff, and they're like, oh, it raises energy levels, and it does this and that. No, it doesn't, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a byproduct in the electron transport chain. You already have enough of it. And that's just kind of another thing that you think about when you think about supplements they try and sell you. Your body produces it. They're just giving you more of it. You, if you have more of it, you don't need it, you eliminate it. So where that money go to? You end up pissing it out, so don't worry about it. So succinate dehydrogenase. And of course, if, if your doctor says you need to take a supplement, take a supplement. Don't ever say, Marla told me I don't need to take a supplement. <laughs> <laughs> Not a doctor, I, I, I don't. Let them determine your medical or your, your, your medical course of treatment. But nonetheless, in normal people, you don't need additional CoQ10. The other uh, thing you're going to see on here is cytochrome BC1. There you'll see something else called cytochrome C, which is not necessarily a complex, but is also involved in this process. And the, la uh, the, the next complex four is called cytochrome C oxidase. You don't really need to know the terms of these. It's okay. Complex one, two, three, four, five. I get it. The fifth complex, on the other hand, is ATP synthase. And right off the bat, if I were to ask you, what do you think ATP synthase does? We know it's an enzyme, because it ends in ACE, just like all these other enzymes end in ACE. What do you think ATP synthase does? Synthesizes. Synthesizes ATP. So that's our final step. So each of these right here, five major complexes, are all in this process of synthesizing ATP. But technically, technically speaking, it's that last bit. All these other in the electron transport chain are going to do exactly that. They're transporting electrons through these major complexes. So we can see that on this next slide. It's a little bit of a dated slide. 
but at least you get the idea of where we're at. Citric acid cycle is happening on the inner fluid area of the innermost membrane of the mitochondria. On the outer layer, this is the outer membrane, the outer layer of the mitochondria. And in between is the inner membrane space in between the inner and outer mitochondrial membrane. And all along the, my, uh, the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane, you'll see one, two, three, four, and then fifth are ATP synthase. These are the enzymes that you saw on this slide right here. So to take a look at what's happening is we have to see the, the process that's taking place. And each of those steps are listed on here. So at least you can see what's taking place. So if you'd like to follow along, I can describe what's happening. The first, ends, uh, the first complex is called NADH dehydrogenase. If you look at the term dehydrogenase, what do you think NADH dehydrogenase is doing? It dehydrogenases. Hydrogen. Yeah, it removes, well, not necessarily with water. Hydrogen. It's removing a hydrogen. And where is it moving the hydrogen from? NADH. So if you're removing a hydrogen, you're also removing an electron that comes with it. So we get an NADH, and NADH carries two electrons and also carries two hydrogens with it. So what we're doing is we're, uh, if we're taking NADH and we're losing electrons, are we reducing or are we oxidizing? We're Oxidize. losing electrons. Oil Oxidize. Oxidize. Oxidation, right? Yes. We're oxidizing. So we're losing electrons. We pull the electrons off that NADH. Those two electrons get handed to the first complex. And what we're doing when we take that high energy electron, we're going to pass it through. And it's going to get passed over to coenzyme Q also known as CoQ10, also known as succinate dehydrogenase. And that's going to hand it over to complex 2. And complex 2, uh, actually no, sorry, complex 2 is uh, succinate dehydrogenase. It's going to now get carried over to complex 3. And when we get complex 3 coming in, coming in we should be able to see it on here, complex 3 is going to take that electron and it's going to pass it over to cytochrome C which is going to now hand it over to complex four. So what we're doing in the electron transport chain is we're taking these high energy electrons that came from the NADH and we're passing it along like hot potato. It's got a lot of energy. We transfer it over to the next step. Then transfer it to the next step and we're removing those, uh, we're removing those high energy electrons and we're removing a little bit of energy from it in that process. What are we doing with that energy? Well, we're driving hydrogen ions across. Every time you have an electron pass over, you're going to allow a, a hydrogen ion to pass through. And it's going to pass from the matrix into the intermembrane space. So we're pumping it across into an area. And if you notice, what we're doing all along these complexes is we're pulling hydrogens against its concentration gradient. I have a couple slides down the line called the Kami osmotic mechanism. This is exactly what I'm describing here. So in that process of passing the electrons through, and in that final step, we get at complex four, we draw, we're driving our third hydrogen ion across. What do we do with those electrons that get left over at complex four? We have these electrons. We've got that last we got that electron that's at that last step. We gotta do something with those electrons. And that's where the electrons combine with two free hydrogen ions come in and meet that oxygen molecule. Where does, where does that oxygen molecule come from? How do you get oxygen? And you kind of breathe it in, right? Breathe. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that's my answer. That oxygen <laughs> comes into the system. <laughs> picks up that electron. So that oxygen ion, uh, that we take that oxygen, we split that oxygen, and that oxygen is now an electron acceptor. So if that oxygen is gaining an electron, is it being oxidized or reduced? Reduced. So the reason we take in oxygen is so that it can be reduced into H2O. Right? In other words, we're taking that oxygen, 
it's picking up two electrons. And if it's picking up two electrons, it's got to pick up those two hydrogens. So two hydrogens and half an oxygen molecule become H2O. So if the question is, why do we breathe oxygen? The sole purpose is the second to last step on the electron transport chain. All it does is it picks up that, those high energy electrons. That's all it does. Because remember what I said from the very beginning. Oxygen and phosphorus are very electron hungry. So they pick up the electrons at the final end. I just yeah. want to make sure I understand it. So NA, NADH is a carrier that goes into every complex, right? NADH, what it's doing is it's actually stripping, uh, the first one is called NADH dehydrogenase. But you have said that the hydrogen have two electrons, but they're losing an electron each, right? Yeah. Oh, where did that come from? I'm sorry, one more time. You said it had two hydrogen electrons when it came in, right? Two, uh, so NADH, it's, it's typically NADH plus a hydrogen ion. And then it starts losing those hydrogen yeah, ions. Yeah, and, it, and it, it pulls those hydrogen ions. One of which that uh, one of the uh, well, two of which those hydrogen ions get shuttled across. Uh huh. Okay. And then we have hydrogen ion. We have the two electrons that come in with it. So we the dehydrogenase pulls those electrons from NADH and passes it along complex three and complex four. And each of those steps is pulling a hydrogen across into the inner membrane space. Did that help? Yeah. Now the question is, what do we do with that NAD plus? What are we going to do with that? We're just going to be like, okay, cool, you're done NAD plus. Go ahead and go die off somewhere. <laughs> no, we recycle it. And that goes through the step. Every other step in glycolysis, in transition cycle, as well as the Krebs cycle. Every one of those steps that needed NAD, NAD plus, it gets recycled in that process. And so we continue. So now we've left off, we've, we've, got our, we've got our water molecule, we've now gotten rid of our oxygen molecule, we have hydrogens now in the inner membrane space. The question is what happens also to FADH2? And FADH2 makes its way into complex 2. It actually bypasses complex 1, because complex 1 is called NADH dehydrogenase. It's not called FADH dehydrogenase. Complex 2 will do it. It only takes complex 2. So it's only driving FADH2, it's driving uh, electrons through complex 3 and complex 4. Don't worry about that, it's written down a little bit down the line. So all that summarizes everything that I've just talked about. This portion right here talks about complex 1, 3, and 4, and shows you the free energy per electron. And that's just showing you that these electrons are very ener uh, high energy electrons, and they get passed through, 1 down 2. And that energy that's freed up from complex 1 to 3 and from 3 to 4 is being used to drive that hydrogen ion across into inner, inner membrane space. So that, in the inner membrane space, is called the chemiosmotic mechanism. And this is what we're doing where we pump those hydrogen ions into that space. So we formed a gradient. And as I said, it uses energy, energy that we saw from those complexes to throw it all up into that into the inner membrane space. In that process, we talked about NADH. We transferred three hydrogen, ion, uh, three hydrogen ions through complex one, three, and four. FADH only transfers through three and four. So with that, we know that FADH only transfers three, FADH transfers two. So with that being said, now that we've had all of our hydrogen ions, we have to take a look at our fifth complex. And that fifth complex, again, is ATP synthase. And what that does is it uses that, I totally forgot about a break, guys. I realize I apologize. I got way too into it. Um, okay, ATP synthase. Is uh, what that's doing is the ATP synthase. It's using that chemiosmotic gradient. It's using those hydrogen ions all the way up to the very top. I totally apologize. I totally not only is it great for you guys, it's also great for me. I realize I did not take a break for myself. Hydrogen ions. Oh, I'm like, why am I like so tired right now? <laughs> so those hydrogen ions are going through, and they're going to make their way down into down this gradient. Okay. 
So hydrogen ions, every time it passes through, it's going to cause this whole ATP synthase to spin and create, what is it creating again? What is ATP synthase synthesizing? ATP. ATP. So it's going to turn ADP into ATP. So ADP plus a phosphate ion. So if you were to look at this ATP synthase molecule, or this enzyme, it's two substrates, or two reactants are ADP and, and phosphate ion, and it's using this gradient. It literally is using all these hydrogen ions that will flow through. It's using it like a waterfall. It's exactly what it's doing is, as hydrogen flows through, it's using that gradient to couple that to phosphorylate ADP to turn it to ATP. And every time a hydrogen ion flows through, it phosphorylates an ADP to ATP. So knowing that earlier, as I described, if NADH transfers three hydrogen ions and FADH transfers two hydrogen ions, we know that each NADH molecule produces three ATP. And each FADH2 produces two ATP. This is actually a really cool molecule because if you take a look and see how it's spinning, all of these right here are subunits. So this you're seeing in its quaternary structure. Each of these right here are tertiary structures that are folded up. Take a look at the outside. These on the outside are hydrophilic groups. On the inside, hydrophobic groups. Each of the sides that are exposed to water are hydrophobic. And then you see the entire configuration of this. If you were ever to study the molecule itself, it spins exactly this way. So that is oxidative phosphorylation. Look at the term oxidative phosphorylation. All we're doing when we discuss the term oxidative, and I have, there it is, oxidative phosphorylation. This is that process right there. What we're doing is the oxidation of NADH to NAD+. This process. Where substrate phosphorylation, we use a substrate. Here, we're Oxidizing, uh, oxidizing NADH to become, uh, to help phosphorylate down the line in ATP synthase to phosphorylate ADP. So that is, let me just kind of quickly sum all that up for you right there. 3D image of protein folding, and I already talked about that. This last one right here is uh, something that helps put this together for you. The electron transport chain is a series of protein complexes embedded in the mitochondrial membrane. Electrons captured from donor molecules are transferred through these complexes. Coupled with this transfer is the pumping of hydrogen ions. This pumping generates the gradient used by the ATP synthase complex to synthesize ATP. The following complexes are found in the electron transport chain. NADH dehydrogenase, cytochrome BC1, cytochrome oxidase, and the complex that makes ATP, ATP synthase. In addition to these complexes, two mobile carriers are also involved, ubiquinone and cytochrome C. Other key components in this process are NADH and the electrons from it, hydrogen ions, molecular oxygen, water, and ADP and PI, which combine to form ATP. At the start of the electron transport chain, two electrons are passed from NADH into the NADH dehydrogenase complex. Coupled with this transfer is the pumping of one hydrogen ion for each electron. Next, the two electrons are transferred to ubiquinone. Ubiquinone is called a mobile transfer molecule because it moves the electrons to the cytochrome BC1 complex. Each electron is then passed from the cytochrome BC1 complex to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C accepts each electron one at a time. 
one hydrogen ion is pumped through the complex as each electron is transferred. The next major step occurs in the cytochrome oxidase complex. This step requires four electrons. These four electrons interact with a molecular oxygen molecule and eight hydrogen ions. The four electrons, four of the hydrogen ions, and the molecular oxygen are used to form two water molecules. The other four hydrogen ions are pumped across the membrane. This series of hydrogen pumping steps creates a gradient. The potential energy in this gradient is used by ATP synthase to make ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. The ATP synthesis steps you see here are discussed in greater detail in the ATP synthase gradients animation. This animation illustrates two full cycles of electron donation. In biological systems, however, many electron transport cycles occur simultaneously, helping to ensure that the proton gradient is always maintained. So now looking at ATP, we just kind of summarize what we've talked about. You saw glycolysis, which was our substrate phosphorylation, and we're going to contrast that with oxidative phosphorylation, which you saw in the electron transport chain. So with glycolysis, we saw 2-net ATP, right? So 2-net ATP from substrate phosphorylation. And then we're going to see those two NADH that we're able to yield from glycolysis move its way over to oxo oxidative phosphorylation. Where in oxidative phosphorylation, for, FA, for every NADH, we produce 3 ATP, and for every, every FADH2, we produce 2 ATP. And when we sum that all up, you're going to be able to see that we get uh, 4 ATP here. We get uh, 2 times 3 for each NADH. Uh, that gives us what a total of, we can add that up quickly, 30? 30. 38. And then, did I get that right? 30. And then the other one, 4. So that gives us 38 ATP. So total 38 ATP. We sum up our 30 and our 4. That gives us 34 through oxidative phosphorylation. Net 4 ATP, or net 2 ATP, I'm sorry, net 2 ATP. This needs to be correct. 2 net ATP through substrate phosphorylation. So now you're wondering why. why how did that come about? We had 34 plus, plus 2, that's 36. How come we have 38 ATP? Well, some, depending on right now, what we've talked about is sort of the generic cell. And different, the, depending on the cells, some cells require ATP in the transition re uh, reaction cycle. So you get, you get a loss of 2 ATP. But general rule is 36 ATP with a little bit of ATP used for some of the processes, depending on the cell. That's all it comes down to. So with that, we should know how we produce. But all of this was all contingent on oxygen being produced. Because what happens, going back to an earlier cycle, what happens if we don't have oxygen in this process? That means we can't get that last step to take place. And if we can't get that last step at, at uh, complex four, we, it'll, it'll be a backup all the way down to the very beginning. So we have to take a look at what's happening in anaerobic respiration. Think about through this whole process. In this whole process, uh, with oxygen, we were using all of our NAD plus to turn it back into NADH to pick up those electrons. So as those NAD were getting, uh, were getting reduced, we have a bunch of NADH. And if we get a bunch of NADH, we're doing a bunch of NAD plus, uh, to NADH. Didn't require, if you go back to our earlier slides, 
The one that didn't require oxygen was glycolysis. And let's take a look at what's happening in glycolysis. In glycolysis, the end product was pyruvic acid. At no point did we ever use oxygen for that. If you don't believe me, go back to your earlier slides and look at glycolysis. And in this process, what we have in anaerobic respiration is a way for us to conserve NAD+. And how we do that? We have a, an enzyme 